Continuing on Law Weekly today, we look at some legislations and lessons from the global pandemic COVID-19. We have the views of a senior advocate of Nigeria, Professor Koinsola Ajayi, also showing on the program more views from senior lawyers on virtual court proceedings, plus a recap of some of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. That's our lineup on this episode of the program. Hello and welcome. I'm Shola Sheeli. Since the outbreak of the coronavirus in Nigeria, governments at all levels have been putting in place measures, including laws and regulations, to contain the pandemic. But there have been criticisms in some quarters about some of the actions of some governors. The argument has been that some state executives are overreaching their constitutional powers by closing state waterways, air and land borders, as some of these measures fall within the jurisdiction of the federal government. On this week's edition of the program, I began by asking my guest, Professor Koinsola Ajayi, if these criticisms are valid from the standpoint of law. Um, I think we have to uh, consider this issue uh, against its context, which is that of uh, a pandemic. Uh, but first of all, let us thank God that uh, the worst uh, of what we thought and what pundits thought we have not seen and pray to God that that doesn't happen. But having said so, we have to be careful. Now, bearing that in mind, um, what does the law say? Because at the end of the day, you know, we must be ruled by law. And our basic law is our constitution, which itself allows for derogation or exemptions in certain circumstances. Now, I don't know that any state government has closed any airspace uh, because they have no rights to do so. Uh, I know that uh, Governor Wiki arrested uh, pilots uh, of Caberton. And as the public knows, you know, Governor Wiki has absolutely unusual methods and uh, which call to question uh, his style, uh, you know, demolishing houses for violation of his regulation. Now, I think that's absolutely unconstitutional, unforget unforgivable, and unforgettable. Uh, but he didn't close the airport, he didn't close the airspace. Uh, what he said was that, well, you can land in the airport, but you cannot leave the airport. Now, under the law uh, by which these governors have been issuing the regulations, uh, the law allows state governors to act where the president has not. I know that before the president came up with his regulation one, Lagos State, for instance, issued a far-reaching and well-written regulation which didn't close the airports or any of the seaways, but said that uh, the perimeter walls and perimeter grounds around the uh, airport our legal state land, and uh, he would exercise control over that area and said that if you come from the airport, which is like a foreign country, into Lagos, then you go into quarantine. Then there are restrictions on what you do or you go into self-isolation, which is reasonable. So that is something that the law allows them to do. Okay. Uh, but the law doesn't allow them to close borders. So in the case of Ogun State, and federal government, um, the issue of interstate transport had come up and the Supreme Court was clear that interstate affairs can only be regulated by the federal government. Now, what we have is that the Nigerian Governors Forum as a body all came together and all agreed that state borders should be closed. And the president in the plenitude of his powers, agree that this can be done. So this makes it legal. So, in, in, you know, to that extent, and to the extent that these are powers being exercised under the Quarantine Act, uh, I think it's fine. I do not know that any governor has closed any waterways uh, because, um, depending on where you sit, uh, interstate waters are governed by the federal government, but Lagos State has gone to court uh, to determine whether uh, waters that are within a state are in the control of the federal government. I believe it has lost um, at the High Court. I believe the matter is still proceeding through its ways in the court. So that's neither here nor there. 
I personally think that in a true federal government, uh, waters within a state should be controlled by the state government. So overall, um, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have a good national approach to this. The federal government issues its quarantine regulations. As far as I'm concerned, not far enough, not deep enough, not well thought through enough. Uh, they could do a lot more. Um, so what well, is... What did you expect the federal to do with that? You said it wasn't far reaching enough. Yes. What, what would they have done differently? So, um, I think the federal government, first of all, uh, should have been driven more by what uh, the DG of NCDC would have to say uh, than what um, the politicians in cabinet and the PTF may have to say. Because this is something that has to be driven by data, by science, and by evidence. And yes, it's public health, economic security. Uh, and one shouldn't dominate the other or the other. There is a fine balance that can be struck. Okay. Now, so in, in, in doing that from the very beginning, uh, what I would expect, for instance, is that the evidence and the science and the data that we had was that Lagos is the most populous state in the country. It's commercial nerve center. It's fifth largest economy. The way we'll deal with Lagos will be such. The way we'll deal with Kano will be such. And I would have, as the governor of Lagos State mentioned at the Emmanuel Chapel webinar on the State of States last Friday, that he would have expected the federal government to have acted a lot quicker in closing the international airport because 60 percent people that come in to the country come through there. And the index came in through there. And so maybe we wouldn't have had this problem. So so federal government should have done that, you know, one. Two, federal government should have set up long ago what I will call isolation centers, not COVID hospitals. In other words, People come in, as we saw them do in Ghana, the many hotels around the airport, take those air, uh, hotels bulk and put them there, let them self-isolate there for two weeks and release them to us as they're clear. And if they're not clear, then from there they go to the hospital. I, I would have expected him to have thought of uh, the courts at that time and to make sure that the courts will continue functioning, but we didn't. So. Uh, the our regulations weren't intelligent. But going they forward, what, what can we do differently? These were things that we should have done that we didn't do. But now, handling going forward with the handling of this pandemic, what can the federal government do better? So what do I expect the government to do? Look at its budget. Because we have an economic epidemic, by which I mean a recession which may go into a depression. All right, central bank governor is trying to hold our currency. We don't know how long he's going to be able to do this, but there are other people who say he can only do it for a short while, oh. and that you know, the, you know, the, the naira will find its real level. And so we need to start to cut out the fat. We need to cut out all the fat. We need to face the national assembly and say, as well, guys, you know, uh, you know, less than a thousand of you and so much money that can build us field hospitals. So, gentlemen, it's not a matter of cutting 20% or 40%. It's a matter of rethinking the whole of that exercise. All right? So, what I would expect is the government to rethink its budget altogether. I'm not an economist, but if the government borrows money heavily now to create high-impact job-creating uh, programs, we will all benefit from it. And that's what the government should be doing. And that's one big problem because a lot of us are worried and are fearful now about our future. Whether I would work tomorrow, whether I'll be well paid, whether inflation is going to kill me. And then we have this pandemic, which is making us sort of a bit cautious. Government needs to give us the confidence by giving the economy a boost. And it's either of two things. I would, if I were Buhari, now say, I'm going to drive the economy by education. So it's an education, and education economy or a health economy. And I now tie everything else, or education, health economy. I tie everything to that. The roads I will build, the schools that I will build, the technology that I will deploy, the bridges that I will build, the power right, that I will build, the waterways that I will dredge, the water that I will make, 
the fashion industry, the clothing industry, the entertainment industry, all is going to be tied around that. Aolawa, when he was Premier, spent over 55, 45% of his budget on education. He had an education economy. But you know what? He just didn't use it to build schools. Everything, the, it was what drove the economy. Uh, but then we'll all see what happened. So a stadium is part of education. So that's what I would do if I was government today. What for you are the lessons from this pandemic for the judiciary? Right. Um, first lesson um, is that it exposed the archaic and analog nature of our courts. It exposed the fact that both bar and bench are not ready for the future. Why do you say that? Uh, because you listen to lawyers and they obsequiously argue that you, know, you can't have virtual hearings and that's unconstitutional. You notice the time it took the courts to embrace this virtual hearing that we have because we don't have any virtual courts at all. The third thing is that it exposed the belly of the misapplication of federalism to the judiciary. Our constitution creates our courts. The making of rules is in the constitution. It's therefore very disappointing, as Yemi Kandi Johnson said in his interview with you uh, a few days ago, that the judges seem to have exhibited a lot of lack of courage and vision in exercising their power by themselves rather than being obsequious, uh, waiting slavishly for directions from NJC or the Chief Justice of Nigeria, when indeed they all have rules of court and nobody wrote the, those rules based on what NJC said. The rules of court that we see are all written by the courts. They don't wait for NJC to write those rules, do they? But anyway, so they all waited in the first instance for NJC to do this. Why can't we? The rules today allow evidence to be given by remote means, i.e. before COVID. Why can't we expand on that? Why can't we get rule read of rigid rules on service of process? Talk to us about the constitutionality of virtual courtrooms. All right. So I think it goes back to what we were just talking about. But uh, in a mock trial uh, between Ogun Miju and uh, Otepa Sinabuki Nigeria before Afrin, these matters were discussed, and you know his ruling was that it is constitutional and that we do not need to amend the constitution. We can't amend the constitution for everything we want to do. And I would rather a wholesale uh, look at a constitution which is a military con contraption as far as I'm concerned, and getting a constitution which is a reflection of the will of the people. Because Justice Nikki Toby, bless, God bless his memory, sat with some people, wrote, you know, uh, Panabited 1979 constitution, added a few things and gave us this constitution and then immediately passed it. Uh, there's no reason why we can't have a, uh, a plebiscite or an election where we appoint members to constitute an assembly and then they give us a constitution. But before then, what can we do? Because we must move on. So my right to go to work, my right to go to church, uh, my right to associate with people, my right to go to a restaurant was all taken away by a regulation. They didn't amend the constitution. There are people that have said that thing is unconstitutional, but the courts have upheld these things. So do we need to amend the constitution? I don't think so. Does section 36 bar this? No. Those people that say the constitution says public didn't say in a building. If it said so, maybe I would say, oh yeah, oh, there's a problem. But it doesn't say in a building. That's the first thing. It just says public. Now, what is more public? We have this building that can seat only 50 people. And we have this platform that allows 10,000 people to watch. It's my question to my colleagues. Public. So what is more important to you, my dear colleagues? 50 men and women in a room 
or in a room that allows literally 200 million Nigerians to watch. Welcome back. The introduction of virtual court proceedings are a big deal because many lawyers who support it say it's the future for the legal profession. But there are many other senior lawyers who call for caution on its usage. We have their views up next. A virtual court proceeding is a good idea, good innovation, good thinking, and it's a good product. But do we have an environment that can accommodate virtual court proceedings? And there are a series of factors, legal, social, and attitudinal that will affect it. For you to effectively and efficiently engage in open uh, virtual court proceedings, you need uh, effective uh, energy, power, stable, uninterrupted. Then, if you have solved the problem of power, then you solve the, the issue of technology is also there. Because you need uninterrupted network supply. Now, who is going to bear the costs of the network supply within the period that the proceedings are to be, uh, to be conducted? Because you need to pay. You need to recite your phone. You need to uh, pay for data. You need to have all that. We don't have free supply of data in this country. And in, in an already impoverished society like Nigeria, and where poor men and women had to go to court to seek justice, are we not now com uh, commercializing justice in terms of virtual court proceedings? Then what about the attitude of lawyers? Do we have lawyers who respect the ethics and the code of conduct of the legal profession by being honest, integrity-driven, who are not going to court corner and not going to be engaged in sharp practices to undermine the efficacy and efficiency of um, virtual court proceedings? Obviously, we're not ready. I mean, at least not fully ready. A few states might be, but generally, we are not ready. But I'm happy that we're starting. And uh, we'll make our mistakes and we'll correct them along the way. But it's important to understand that you don't just jump into a, a project of this nature because you have a crisis. We should learn from this crisis and uh, prepare uh, the necessary infrastructure and facilities so it will be seamless. Court proceedings are a very serious matter and um, you, we can't afford any mistakes in them. Look, we've used this in international arbitrations for a few years now and we've pushed this with the courts in Nigeria. Um, I, I, I really shouldn't say that I'm happy that uh, this crisis has brought that about because it's, the crisis is that of illness and death. So um, I'll just say that it's a bit of a tragedy that it's only now that we're being forced to understand that we must allow better participation of technology in our courts. Look, the Federal High Courts were all equipped with automatic recording equipment more than 10 years ago. Only a few judges are using them. We just have not invested in the training of our judges, the training of our lawyers, and the training of court personnel. We must do that. In fact, um, I dare say that until we embrace these technologies, for instance, eliminating the writing of court notes by judges, at the High Court, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, and even in Magistrates Court, until we eliminate those, we are still practicing 16th, 17th century uh, procedure because there are too many risks and then look at all the delay that it occasions. So this is a good idea, but I just hope that the various chief judges that have implemented this have thought about all the challenges. And just before we go, here's a recap of some legal stories we're tracking. We we'll begin with the report that the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos has fixed June the 2nd to hear an application by the former Abia State Governor Senator Oji Uzokalu seeking his immediate release from the custody of the Nigeria Correctional Service, Kuje Abuja. On that day, Justice Mohamed Limon will hear the application. Besides seeking his release, the former governor also wants an order of the court setting aside his conviction dated December 5, 2019 under the hand of Honorable Justice Mohammed Idris, since the Supreme Court, in its judgment of May 8, 2020, held that it was given without jurisdiction. Senator Kalu has also asked the court to set aside the trial and the sentence passed on each of the 39 counts made against him. 
Kali is serving a 12-year jail term at the Correctional Service Center in Kujé, Abuja for allegedly laundering 7.65 billion naira belonging to Abia State. He had a 12-man team of lawyers, including six senior advocates of Nigeria. In Sokoto, the High Court has granted bail to two Chinese citizens accused of bribing an official of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. A chief judge, Justice Mohamed Seydou Sifawa, granted the accused persons bail in the sum of 5 million naira each and two sureties in like sum, one of whom must be resident in Sokoto and have a landed property complete with a certificate of occupancy. He also asked the accused persons to submit their international passport to the chief registrar of the court as they are not allowed to travel out of the country throughout the duration of the trial. In granting bail, the Chief Justice said the anti grout Commission has not been able to dislodge the presumption of innocence of the accused persons. The suspects were arrested last week for offering the sum of 100 million naira bribe to the zonal head of the EFCC in Sokoto State, Mr. Abdullahi Lawal. The EFCC says the sum was allegedly offered in a desperate bid to compromise ongoing investigation of a construction company, China Zongao Nigeria Limited, which was handling contracts awarded by the Zamfara State Government in the sum of 50 billion naira between 2012 and 2019. In Bayelsa, the Federal High Court sitting in Yanogwa, the state capital, has sentenced Yinusa Dahiru to 26 years in prison after finding him guilty of child trafficking and other charges. The trial lasted about four years. In August 2015, Dahiru had taken a minor, Ese Uru, from her home in Bayelsa to Kanu, where she was married to him and her name changed to Aisha. After months of outcries from her parents and human rights activists, as well as investigations by the police, she was returned to Bayelsa in March 2016, pregnant with a child. On May 26, 2016, Essie was delivered of a baby and Dahiru was later charged with child trafficking, child abuse, rape, kidnap, infringement on the rights to religion and holding a person against her will. In Abuja, the Kogi State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal has dismissed a petition filed by Natasha Akboti, the candidate of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, and her party against Governor Yahya Bello. A three-man panel of judges led by Justice Kashim Kaigama dismissed the suit in a unanimous judgment. The petitioners had filed the suit to challenge the victory of Governor Yahya Bello of the All Progressives Congress in the November 16, 2019 governorship elections. Delivering the lead judgment, Justice Kegama held that the petition failed woefully as the testimonies given by the petitioner's witnesses amounted to hearsay and had no probative value. The tribunal also awarded a cost of 600000 to be paid by the petitioners to the three respondents, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, the APC and Governor Bello. And we round off with the report that members of the Nigerian Bar Association, Benin City Chapter and a coalition of civil society groups, both in Edo State, have called on the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, to urgently deploy rapid response investigative teams to the state over the kidnap and murder of one of their colleagues, Mr. Omon Osobase. The NBA and CSOs also called on the state governor, Godwin Obaseki, to invoke his powers as the chief security officer of the state to predict the provisions of the state law against kidnapping and other crimes with a view to bringing the perpetrators of the acts to book. They stressed that the state government and security agencies cannot fold their hands and allow certain individuals and groups to take laws into their hands. The group particularly challenged the various heads of security agencies in the state, especially the state's commissioner of police, the commander of the 4th Brigade of the Nigeria Army in Benin City, and the Department of State Security, DSS, to rise to the occasion within 24 hours by unraveling the circumstances behind the abduction of the lawyer, Omon Osobase. <laughs> And here's where we are joined till next week. Don't forget that you can watch again this episode of the program and past episodes on our YouTube channel. I'm Shola Shealy. Thank you for watching.